I am so sorry. How's that? I think I got sound now. Is that good? I'm so sorry. I have, um, I, I think it should be on now. So sorry about that. Let's start again. This is Scale Model Craft, uh, How To Diorama. Does that help any? Sorry. Um, but I think we got sound now. Uh, thanks very much, Paul. And, and thanks very much, uh, Eric. I appreciate it. So this week, uh, it was pretty cool. Um, you know, at the end of last week, I had done some of the un underground building and, and, and we talked about, you know, the modular form of how I like to build where everything is modular and stuff like that. Well, the, the only thing that I had built up until that point was this and, and, and two other rooms, but I had a whole bunch of other stuff that I needed to build. And so that's kind of, you know, what I, I started off doing. Uh, mouth moving, no sound. Yeah, that's how it was. But we're good now. Thanks very much. Um, Martin is here. Hey, thanks very much from uh, coming in from Holland. Thanks very much, Martin. I really appreciate it. Uh, Paul and Eric got the sound going a little bit ago, so that's really good. Um, but yeah, so uh, this week has been about, you know, filling up more of that underground area. And so I'm going to show you where we are. I am going to go to camera three and do one of these little deals. Um, and there we go. So this is, um, I'm going to get me in the right spot. I don't even know what I'm doing. Okay. So this is um, what it looks like now with all the different wooden uh, parts of it built. So these are all individual little uh, uh, like rooms, passageways, tunnels that I can pull out, work on, and 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 put back. So that's really what I did last week is, is just kind of finishing all of those. Hey, John is here. Thanks very much, John, for coming in. Hello, sir. Um, so yeah, I, I did a whole bunch of that. Um, I started off here. So I've got one corner and I'm going to jump ahead so I can show you too. Here is this corner and this corner, I'm going to see if I can get a layout here. Geez, I'm all over the place, aren't I? I'm going to go back to the very beginning because here you can see like under the top level, that pink area. Well, that's where this, this little corner is going to go. And, and that's where they have an active tunnel being dug. And the issue I found was, well, if I have an active tunnel and they use these little uh, like narrow gauge rail cart lines to move the, the sandbags and the dirt through the tunnels to get it out of the uh, out of the, you know, where they're digging and mining. Well, you come to a corner. What the heck are you going to do? So I made uh, this little this little turntable. Now I was saying turnstile earlier. It's not a turnstile. It's a turntable. And uh, I was corrected. And, and thank you very much for correcting me on that one. Um, so I put that in there. What you're seeing here is how I embedded a little sleeve of brass into the diorama. And by embedding that there and gluing it in, that gave a nice pivot. And, and that pivot works on the right-hand picture there on the little circle. That's the, the little turntable. That slides into there very nicely, and so it pivots on that. So then um, I, I got it all centered and stuff like that, and I built this. This is going to be painted to look like iron, so it's got an iron band around it. And then I mounted just a small piece of N-gauge track. Now, this N-gauge track... Um, was like the smallest that I could find already built up. And I even thought about not using the little ties that come with it, you know, just using the rails. But I think the ties that come with it immediately say to me, rail track. And I think that's important. You know, one of the, one of the big deals that I'm always trying to kind of convey is I want immediate recognition in a diorama, right? I, I want to be able to have the diorama to have elements that you're not going, what, what is that? You know, if you're, I mean, if it's, if it's quizzical because you're interested in it and, and, and it, and it's like something that you want to check out, that's one thing, right? 
but I don't want it to be so you're like, that doesn't make sense, right? I'm not recognizing what he's doing. Or, or, or why did they do that? I mean, if it's, you know what I mean? So I'm, I'm kind of balancing that kind of a deal. And this was part of that. It might have been more accurate even to put the rails just mounted on the wood, like I saw in some drawings. And, and I did see in some uh, illustrations that I have, but I think doing it like this makes it much more recognizable. Um, so now I'm just going to show you, I, I, I built the little tunnels and, and here's how I build my tunnels. It's really not um, difficult, hard, whatever, though I am working on a little class that I, I spoke about last week. Um, I am working on a little class that I'm going to give where Everybody has a little kit they can buy with materials. And then we do some woodworking because it is a little bit different than, than if you're a modeler, you've maybe not done a little bit of work woodworking. And I think there's some great things you can do. So anyway, uh, Oh, Marcus here. Uh, and then Martin has a, a, a question. Uh, Martin says, how did you glue it? PVA? No, actually I like using super glue or cyanoacrylate. Um, CA glue for wood and it, it works really really fast number one um, it's typically not seen I mean I've done it where I've globbed a bunch of it on there and so you can see it but it works really well and so all of this is done with super glue and on the on the porous woods like the balsa it glues fantastic. It soaks in really, really careful or, or really, really great. But you've got to be careful because it can cause some issues too. Hey, Mark is here. Hello, Mark. It's great to see you. Thanks very much for coming by. I really appreciate it. So we're just talking about, you know, building these. And, you know, this is the same kind of wood that I've done before. If you look at the top of the back post, it's kind of white in color. Um, and, oh, 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 I'm sorry. I, I, I got a better question here. Martin, thanks very much for re-asking that. I meant the brass tube embedded in the foam. Okay, folks, this is a really good point. And, and I, Eric is asking the same thing. I think that's a really good point because if you try to use super glue, which is what I actually used, if you try to use super glue on the pink foam, what it's going to do is it's going to melt the pink foam. So I should have taken more time and, and spoken about this. So Right there is the PVA. And I think Martin said, you know, is this PVA? Well, yes, that is PVA. And so what I did was I got in here, you know, I, I made sure it was the right place that I wanted first. But I pulled out the sleeve. I put PVA inside the hole. And, and what I wanted to do with that PVA inside the hole is I'm trying to seal the foam so that it is dry and sticks to the foam and creates a barrier so that I can then use the CA glue that I finally used to mount that in there. I can then use the CA glue and it won't melt the plastic. Because if you go with uh, the CA glue right to that foam, it will melt it. So very, very good points, um, Martin and Eric. Thanks for asking and, and, and asking me to clarify. So yeah, that's exactly what I did. Um, the PVA glue that's on the outside here was just to make sure that I had enough sealer there around that because I wasn't sure if I was going to glue that part down yet or not. So I just put more PVA glue around that so it was sealed off. And here you can't see it. There you can't see it. Um, but yeah, I'm seeing if there's another place where I show it. There really isn't. But I mean, that's what I did. You know, I did use PVA, coated that entire area put PVA inside the hole and look, PVA does not want to dry very quickly without a lot of airflow. And so to get it to dry in that hole, it actually took a number of hours. I had to go in there and lighten, you know, the, uh, the thickness of the PVA that I put in that hole so that I could secure it. So it's, I think it's really important to, to get that down first and then use your CA glue. So thank you very much, Eric and Martin. That's a, that was a very good point to make. And if you have any more questions, please ask because yeah, I did take special considerations to get that piece of brass in that foam. Josh is here. Uh, 
Thanks very much, Josh. Looking forward to our AMPS meeting tomorrow. Yeah, we're going to have the Seattle AMPS meeting out at my place uh, tomorrow, uh, which is very weird because I don't have people to the shop. It's just like I don't. I have like one person that comes to the shop. His name is Stephen Robbins. We, we Robbins, we've been you know friends for a long time, and he's he's part of like our our um, our model groups and stuff like that. So Stephen comes out. But I don't really have anybody else out. So, wow, it's it's kind of cool to have somebody uh, have some people over. Um, Neil is here. Hello, Neil. Thank you very much. Now, does everybody remember Mr. Neil Bullard? I talked about Neil Bullard's um, dioramas and his very, very realistic. And I think they're one six scale or one twelfth scale. I mean, it's like a 12 inch figure that he's working with. And they're just phenomenal. And, and I think I directed a few people to go there. So Neil is here. Thank you very much, Neil. And I'd love to hear your comments about how I'm doing stuff and, and things like that. Neil confirmed it's one sixth scale that he does. Very nice stuff. Man, his cobwebs are brilliant. And so I, I think I asked him, that was one of the first things I ever asked him the very first time I saw his stuff. He's like, how are you doing that? And I think he just said it was... Um, was it just PVA? I don't know. See, I, I got to ask again, but um, thanks very much for coming on, Neil. And, and I'd love to have, you know, any insights as, as we go forward. Hey, Scott's here. Howdy gang. Hello, Bill. Looking forward to seeing this. Thanks very much, Scott. Uh, I hope it's a little bit cooler in Texas now. Uh, that's, that's been a heck of a deal there. Uh, go for it painting. Hello. Thanks very much for coming in. I really appreciate seeing it. And that was just Neil confirming it's one six scale that he does his dioramas. Brilliant dioramas. Now, the other thing that Neil does is, and it's something I've I've wanted to do uh, for a long time. I've, I've I've talked about it for two or three years, just with friends. Um, I've wanted to film some of my dioramas in like a short story, tell a short story with it, or a little video. And Neil's done some of that too. So, yeah, love to hear more about that, Neil. Uh, Scott, a uh, tad bit cooler. Thanks very much. I, I, I mean, I worry about you guys down there. My brother lives in Texas and uh, man is a heck of a deal with 115 and 110 and stuff. Just crazy, crazy stuff. Well, let's take a look at this again. Let's get back to this. So I, I hope everybody has gotten some, some answers there uh, because yeah, I, it is uh, very important when you're securing that and using CA glue that you don't put CA glue right on the foam. It will melt it. It's just so hot. It's got these chemicals in it. Um, and uh, I think it's acetone or something like that. And I'll just burn right through this stuff. So very, very good point. Thank you very much, gentlemen. So I went through that. I mounted that on there. I made that little circle on that. Cutting that circle was rough. I, I have a circle cutter, but cutting a circle inside a circle, like for a flange like this, Super difficult, so I had to do it by hand, but it came out fine. Um, this works great. It turns on there. I did mount this. I didn't mount all of the track. I mounted two parts of it, this and then the follower that, that I'll show you here in a second. Um, but I did not mount the other track because it, well, I'll, I'll tell you why. Here was a little fun. So I, I kind of hadn't thought about how I'm going to mount this, but I mean, it worked out fine. But to mount these together, I didn't leave myself basically a mechanical joint. And, and, and what I mean by a mechanical joint is in woodworking, there's something called dovetailing. Or you can use like well, a screw is a, is a man, mechanical joint. So you've got two pieces of wood, you put them together. And so this piece of wood's over that piece of wood. And so you screw down through the top one into the bottom one. That's a mechanical joint, the screw going through it. Well, to do that, you have to plan ahead. I didn't is what I'm trying to get at. And so instead of using a mechanical joint, I used a glued up joint on this corner. And I mean, it worked fine because there's no stress on it, but there's a little green uh, tub back there. And, and what that is, is um, uh, baking soda. And so what you can do is you can take baking soda and when you couple that with super glue, it makes a, a hard, fast cement. I mean, this stuff is nuts. It's going nowhere. And so what I do is I just take a little bit of the, the, the um, baking soda up there, 
put it on there with a brush. Be careful because wherever you put that, it's not going to want to come off. You're going to damage the wood trying to get it off. You get it somewhere you don't. So I'm real careful to put it in there and then just drip my super uh, thin super glue on it. It's instantaneous and it works great. Um, it makes almost a mechanical bond because the powder in it gives it substance. It's not just the glue holding to itself. The, the, the glue and the powder works together and creates this amazing bond. I use this in a few places. And, and for me, it's a nice way to do stuff. Once I got that, I, I went ahead and finished out the corner with all my beams. And one of the things that I like to do when I'm doing this stuff is I like to look at it a lot because that's going to you know tell me what the next part of this is. Now, this, be, I was trying to tell you before where I put tracks. So what you're looking at right now is the front of the diorama as you look at it straight ahead. And in front of you, you see the longer piece of track and then the little turntable piece of track. Well, it's the longer track on the right going back towards the back of the diorama that's not connected. And the reason is back in that corner, you see where it's still pink? That's where I'm going to have the actual digging going on. So this is where I'm going to show three gentlemen. And, and Neil Bullard did this already in his diorama he's currently working on. So that's really cool. Um, but it shows how they dug these tunnels because it's not just like, you know, taking a pickaxe and, you know, going to town. They had to be quiet. As they're digging these tunnels under no man's land and, 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 and physically under German trenches, occupied German trenches, they were digging under those. Um, you had to be so quiet because, of course, the Germans found out about this and they are digging counter tunnels. And so there were times where the tunnels came together. There are times where they passed a tunnel, they could hear somebody, they busted in. All kinds of things. So you had to be very careful and very cautious about the methodologies that are in use in digging down there. So you're not just going at it. There's no jackhammers going on. It's a guy with a shovel, right? Or sometimes just by hand because it's so delicate. So there's a very special method that they develop to do this. And um, that's what I'm going to show here. So I'm really excited to, to, to do that. And for that, I needed to keep that track uh, loose. Hey, Mr. Erdink is here. Thanks very much, Erdink, for coming by. Hello, sir. It's great to see you. Um, and so when I'm doing this, I'm kind of thinking, okay, what am I going to do next? What parts of this are going to be affected? But I wanted to hold off on diving right into this digging part because I wanted to get my figures. I want to get my figures so I can kind of uh, build them up and get them in the positions I want and then put them in that because it's it's a very specific thing that they have to have. It's a very, not thing, uh, it's a very specific position because of what they're doing. Um, so uh, I got to be real careful with that. Uh, the next thing that I done, uh, so th I'm sorry, that's the, just the, the the one that goes down there is I want to take like a picture and I use my iPhone for this and it works great so that I'm standing in it. You know, I'm really trying to get super close so that I can get the perspective of standing in it or even crouching it because these are small tunnels. You couldn't probably stand fully in it. I want to get those pictures. I want to get those shots so that I can see if I'm close. I, it's, it's almost like a little reality check, right? You want to look and see if you're, if, if it's looking realistic, if, if you're getting there. So the, the best way I've been able to do it um, is to just take my iPhone, get super close and take it because if you get down there at eye level and you're looking at it, just physically looking at it, you just really don't get, that perspective, but you'd really do when you take your photo of it. So I, I think that's a really important part. Do that a lot. And, and, and I think it's going to help. Next thing I went to build. Well, this wasn't the next thing because I did this little hallway to the left in this, in the uh, picture, but I just want to talk about this. This is the testing area. And, and so what I did was here's the bigger view of everything above is the tunnel that we were just looking at with the little turntable in it. And then below is the area 
which is going to be the testing laboratory. So I just love, you know, 007 and stuff growing up and you saw Q and they would go and they would, you know, get all of his cool tools and stuff. But there was also testing going on in the background, right? There'd be like a flamethrower, you know, there'd be darts, there'd be explosions. There'd be a new car that Bond is going to get. Well, because this is a British tunnel, I figured, you know, some of that had to come from somewhere. So why not? So that's what this tunnel is going to be. Or not tunnel, but this room is going to be. So this room is built to be that testing lab, that area where either weapons or whatever are tested before they, they get them out there. So since we're doing a flamethrower, I needed to build this little backstop. I wanted a brick backstop. And so I bought a bunch of these little 135th scale bricks and started building this little backstop. But I kind of ran into a problem. They're really nice bricks. As a matter of fact, I think they're a little bit too nice. They look like they're molded. They're not. They're individual bricks. And I stacked them up maybe a little bit too precisely. And it gave me something that, to me, looks a little bit too perfect. I don't want it to be perfect. So that's an issue. Uh, and, and I'm going to have to deal with that. Oh, I got a, a, a question here from Neil. So Neil says, will you paint the track supports before you install the timber tunnel frame in place, then add the mud, or do you do it once it's installed, Bill? Yeah. So I'm going to I'm gonna basically, on the, on the timber and stuff like that, underneath the tracks, I've got to paint all those. They're not going to be black. They're gonna, I'm going to paint them so that they look like actual timber. Then I'm going to, well, I'll glue it in first. Then I'll put, I'll paint it and then I'll put the mud on it and then hopefully wash away some of the mud to reveal the ties underneath the track. Cause I don't want the track to look like model track. I want it to look like actual track. Um, and, and that's kind of how I'm doing it. There is going to be a lot of mud, the, you know, and, and that's something that Neil um, did in his diorama so effectively was all the amount of mud that was in there. I mean, the whole thing is just poof, mass mud in it. Well, and, and that's what they were dealing with. So yeah, there's going to be a lot of that. There's going to be a lot of weathering on the walls. There's going to be broken boards. There's going to be broken beams. There's going to be stuff that has been shorn up, like it broke and they tried to, re you know, there's going to be a lot of stuff doing, but I want to build everything kind of nice, perfect, whatever, and then break it. So there's a lot of that going on. Um, I want to, I'm reading your question back, make sure that I did answer it properly. Uh, paint the track supports before you install the timber tunnel frame in place, then add. Oh, okay. And I built the entire tunnel frame, but I'm going to leave one side open, right? So one side will stay open, but I did the top, the bottom and the back first, then install that. So it is going to be a little harder to paint. But I mean, heck, I could pry it up if I wanted to, to paint it, because I do want them painted nicely. Um, Martin Drayton did a really great job earlier this year. Uh, he painted some train tracks on a train crossing he was doing for one of his armor vehicles. And, and I think he did a really nice job. And so that's what I want to do. I want to try to really get those done. But yeah, I, I just build the, the tunnel and then I put the track in. Okay. Uh, I've got Martin says, uh, by the way, for World War One, I, I highly recommend the novel Bird Song by Fox Tunneling Features. Oh, okay. Bird Song by Fox. Okay. That, that would be good because, you know, one of the other things that I saw, like in the movies and some of the pictures I saw, were um, canaries. And that just tells you, you know, you always heard about canary in a coal mine, you know, that old thing. Well, it's real, number one. And it was just another one of the dangers, you know, there are times you, you just, you hit a pocket or something like that, or, or, or these gases slowly seep in to the tunnel you're digging and some heavy gases stay at the bottom of the tunnel, man, I'll tell you, it's, it's a, a, a crazy thing. So uh, bird song, I, I would imagine relates somewhat to the tunneling. Uh, so very cool. Thanks very much, Martin. Uh, features heavily in this novel. Very cool. Thank you very much. 
Uh, Flopka, thank you very much. Good afternoon, evening all. Thanks very much for joining us. Neil says, and rats, lots of rats. I actually built a little place where I'm going to have a rat. Well, maybe more, but yeah, that was fun to, to, to kind of think of. Okay, so I'm not sure exactly what I'm going to do with this brick. I'm certainly going to paint it. Um, the original idea was to have it, you know, it's a, it's a, a stop. It's a backstop. So what it's doing is I'm going to be shooting flame into it and it, it just needs to be able to stop it from, you know, burning them all up. Obviously they're underground. It's a little bit of a, a stretch, but all of my dioramas are, you know, they're, they're all fantasy. I'm not, I'm basing it on real stuff, but, but yeah, they, they wouldn't have this in World War I's underneath the lines. But I still want to try to make it like, you know, what if? Could they have done it? So that's what this is meant to be. Um, so it's going to be like burnt. Now, why is it dry stacked and why is there no mortar? That's a really good point. When I worked, um, gosh, years ago, I, I had a friend that had um, uh, a forge. And what he told me was in his forge and stuff, because it was just a little tiny forge, is you dry stack your uh, bricks because they're um, always expanding and contracting and your mortar will crack if you're always heating it up and cooling it down and heating it up and cooling it down. So with fire, dry stacking is fine. There's nothing impacting and there's nothing hitting it. Um, they're just dry stacked. And if some bricks do deplete over time because of the intense fire, you can just unstack them, pull those bricks out, put new bricks in. So I went with dry stacked. Well, again, it looks a little too perfect. So I, I, I got to do some more to it. The other thing that I wanted to do was get some sandbags on it, like some backing and, and stuff like that. So I put sandbags on the front and back of it. And um, I, I like that much better. Um, and then I think it, it fills the space a little bit better as well. So the next thing I started in on um, was a standing chalkboard. So, you know, I mean, I'm a huge Indiana Jones fan. Um, and the first Raiders, when they go into the library at the very beginning of the movie and they're, you know, they're, they're talking to the government agent uh, agents uh, about this new thing that they have to go and do. Um, he's drawing on a standing map uh, or a standing chalkboard. And so I always want to make one. So I turn these little tiny styles and uh, I got to get over here and change the picture. Sorry. Turn these little tiny styles and made a little tiny, um, a little tiny chalkboard. Um, and it works, which is kind of fun. And for the chalkboard, it's just a piece of wood and flat paint. Um, yeah, it just, just works fine. Um, it's a little bit light in color. So I did, and later on you'll see it, I did um, kind of use my uh, the uh, vinegar and um, steel wool solution to age it. So I think it looks a lot better because it, it shouldn't be that bright. Uh, but that's going to be in there and that's there's going to be drawings. And I'll, I'll figure out what drawings are in there. And then I also, because this is like a working, uh, where they're designing things, I made a couple of workbenches in that same room. And those workbenches are going to need tools. So I got to build tools or I got to make tools or I don't know how I'm going to do all that, but there's kind of the, the bird's eye view from the top down. You can see where the workbenches are. And then I started on the Livens uh, flame projector. So now the Livens flame projector, let me see. There's a picture of it. So, uh, and, and I've got more pictures later on that I'll show you so you get an idea. So I just had this on my monitor last night. This is the Livens large gallery flame projector. And what it does is the bottom basically is a big hydraulic ram that pushes this thing up through the soil. And as it, as it emerges, you know, uh, proud of the, the, the soil, then it kicks on, you throw a lever and it kicks on this high, well, the high pressure is what 
what drives it up, but then it kicks on the fuel and that it ignites and then it sprays the Germans. It can be, you know, swiveled left and right. There's a big handle in the back. And so that's what I'm looking at as I'm building that. And, and, and this is what I came up with. I did it all out of brass uh, just because I just figured it would be a lot easier to do. And I have some of those small brass pieces where I can like cut them and, you know, slip ones inside the other stuff, try to do make hydraulic rams and stuff. So I'm, I'm pretty happy with that. I think it came out great. Um, I think it looks pretty darn close to the to the picture, the Libens gun. And then here is here it is with uh, primer on it. Um, and and there's a, a cleaner picture. I think it's easier to see. So that's that's what the Libens looks like. Um, and then they're showed it's a little bit taller than the guy because it's in 135th. So I'm really happy with it. I'm, I'm, I think it came out great. Now I've got to figure out you know, how I'm going to fuel it. So this is it in the testing lab. Um, I think it fits. It's a little bit high. So I think what I got to do is maybe kind of dig down just, I don't know, quarter inch or something like that, and maybe have a dropped area where it's put in. You know, I've already got this, this raised area back here, uh, you know, here near the rear. That's a raised area right in here. I don't know if you can see my mouse. I'm trying, uh, but it's under the bench here in the back of the room. And then forward of that, it steps down just a little step. And then we've got this. I think that what I'm going to do for the Livens gun, because I wanted to hit a little bit lower on the wall and I don't want to raise the wall. I think that the wall is about the height I want. You know, I want to be able to see the top of the bricks. I don't want to just this, this monolithic wall, I, I want to see the tops of the brick to show that they're just dry stacked, right? They're just, they're just stacked on there. So I think what I've got to do is, is maybe lower the Libens gun. And so I'll do that. Um, this is, I think it looks really good in here. I think it fits the, the, the space very well. And so I'm just going to continue working in this room, kind of filling it out uh, this week, you know, getting more details and all that kind of jazz. Um, and then here is the big picture of the Livens gun. That's what I was looking for before. So you see the end all the way to the right. That's the, the part that I built last night. And we just looked at the five tanks that come after that. Um, uh, so the top picture is the whole Livens gun. The five tanks that come after it are the middle shot there. Those are what hold the fuel. And then the bottom image, I'm just looking at the far right. These are 2002 tanks, and those are to pressurize the entire system. So there's no compressor. They can't pressurize it that way. They have to pressurize it with pressurized gas. So they have CO2 gas in those canisters. I have to look at the fuel again. I had the fuel. It's it's something kind of funky sounding. So that's why I, I don't have the fuel for you. But, you know, those five fuel, fuel tanks. Now... I'm not going to, this is like what I'm saying in this picture or, or what I'm trying to present here is it's a test, you know, facility. So I don't really have to have all five of those tanks and all 20 of those CO2s or, or the entire ring, you know, rail set up and stuff like that. That's not really what I think I'm looking for. What I'm looking for is I need a fuel cell that resembles what it, it, it has in the, in, in the full-size gun. Because this thing is 56 feet long, it ain't fitting with what I built. So I just want to have some fuel tanks that represent it, that look like it, of course, and some of the O2 tanks in there. And, and I think that's going to be fine to, to be able to show this thing firing. Then I can do the scorching on the brick wall. I can do all kinds of other stuff. And I'm going to have like extra parts, uh, you know, on these, on these workbenches, tools, toolboxes, just different stuff. Because I, I really think it would be fun um, to see them working on it to get it working, you know, properly. So, uh, yeah, I really like it. Uh, and Flo Kip says, that Livens gun looks like something from the Machining Krieger universe. It, it really does. I mean, but the, the funny thing is, is this is a real thing. It was deployed four times. Um, in, now, there's a link in, in, the, um, in the description of the broadcast. 
And that link goes, there's two links. There's the Wikipedia link, which is where I got this cool image that shows the Lemons gun um, or the Lemons flame projector. And there's a link for, um, uh, was it hydrazine? That doesn't sound familiar. It was something with an A, I believe, but I could be wrong. Um, so uh, do you think you'll build a scale version of the full-size Livens gun to display with this diorama? I, You know, after building it, that's a possibility. I don't know if I would do it with this one because I, I got so much to do here, but it's a possibility. The idea at first was to literally build that entire assembly and it was a three foot long diorama. That's why I didn't do it. But um, yeah, it, it's quite possible. Okay, so back to the links that I put in there. I just want to tell you, there's two links in there. One is Wikipedia and the other one is to Timeline. Now, earlier this week, I had commented to somebody that I saw a video about this. It's like five years old, something like that. And it was Time Team. It's not Time Team, it's Timeline. It's a UK, uh, a British um, television show, BBC television show. And it's really cool. And what they do is they dig up a Lemons gun that had collapsed and stuff during World War II. So they go in and and, and they find parts of it uh, in France. Um, I believe it was in Messines. So um, that show is on there. And then um, it also shows where they construct the, the British, I don't know if it was EOD or, or what, but they construct a new one just to be able to see its lethality. You know, they, they wanted to get all the properties, but they use new equipment. They use different pumps. They use different kind of fuel bladders. They, they did it differently, but in essence, it was the same thing. And they showed the, the range of it. And I got to tell you, it's remarkable. Um, a devastating weapon. It would not, I think I explained this before, it would not only shoot uh, the fuel, but it wasn't like propane like you see in the movies where you hit the propane and it burns as long as the fuel's there. You cut off the fuel, it dies away pretty darn quick, right? Because there's just no fuel. If it catches something on fire, that's a different story. But the flamethrower is shooting liquid fuel and the liquid fuel would douse anything that it's you know being aimed at and it would continue to burn after the Livens gun was even shut off. So, man, devastating weapon. Um, when they, it was used, the folks across from it, the Germans that, that it was being deployed against, they had no idea. This was never seen before. Nobody had ever even conceived of this thing before, you know, Captain William Livens came up with it. And it was meant to, as most of the weapons back then, it was meant to shorten the war. Um, it may have, but the war went on for 18 months after that. That was in 1916 that he, he developed the Livens gun. So anyway, very fascinating subjects. I really think it would be fun to, to look at it. I was fascinated the first time I saw the show, number one. And then when I did the research and, and read about it, interestingly enough, Captain Livens, after the war, um, invented the the washing machine the dishwasher was yeah i think it was the dishwasher it, was, it wasn't the clothes washer he invented the dish, dishwasher so who to know but anyway i thought it was pretty interesting so let's get back to looking at this um so that there is uh what it looks like so far i think it's a fun little lab i think if i lower that it'll be cool and then i'm gonna have like hoses coming out of there because i thought maybe in that back corner i could add fuel and i thought well that would be stupid because you have like fuel, you know, where basically you're pointing. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to, you know, bring the fuel out um, here. Uh, so this is the, the, the hallway that I came up with that leads to this testing area. And so that hallway, I think I'm going to line the back of it with like fuel canisters and stuff like that, and then have hoses coming into the testing lab. I think that would just be interesting too. I just think that would be kind of cool looking. So you have all these hoses on the ground and, you know, going in and stuff like that. I'm also thinking to have like some blast shields uh, that you can put up. Um, I've also got, well, it's not right here, but I've got plenty of the corrugated tin. And I think that's got a place in here too. 
Um, somebody mentioned last week on, on my uh, texts and stuff like that on, on, cause I do daily shorts about this, you know? Um, but I thought I might have to use some of that tin to wrap some of the beams and the posts in that room. Um, I don't think it should be kind of just, you know, left. So the heat from this thing could, could get out of hand. Um, and then a vent, uh, possibly vent it. Now in, uh, digging tunnels, the sappers would use vents. Those vents though, were typically to, to either bring out noxious air or just dead air. You know, it's got too much O2 levels are too high. Um, just because you're so far and, and there's no air circulating. So they use hand, uh, pump, um, for water, for getting water out of there, but they always also had for ventilation. Uh, so I don't know if that was a hand pump. I think it was, but it was a larger tube and it went down below to try to get air to, to circulate down in there. So all that stuff I think is going to be very interesting to have on the floor, to have on the foreground, you know, to, 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 to kind of help show the story. Um, so that's, what's coming up. Okay. Uh, what do we got next? I think that's pretty close to being done uh, with what I did last week. I want to talk about my patrons. Uh, thank you very much, my patrons. Um, I'm, I'm actually getting much more, um, much more active on Patreon. Thanks very much to John Robeck. John kind of helped me, you know, get over the hump a little bit. And, and, and so, and Mark Doremus is on there too. So if you're interested in becoming a patron. Uh, I really appreciate it. Um, I am doing uh, an update every single day, uh, even on the weekends, because I work on it on the weekends. Why won't, wouldn't I? So every day at 10, I do a short with an update. Um, and so some of the stuff those folks have seen, but they haven't seen it to the detail. Um, so anyway, I think it's kind of cool. Uh, let me see. Where's the hydrazine? Uh, from weapons of match destruction to sparkling dishes. Yes, John, he was just a, a true visionary. He was considering the projector uses flammable liquids. Having the projector in a recess would keep any spilled liquids contained. Good excuse for a recess under the projector. That's a really good idea. Um, just kind of sinking it down. Number one, it'll get me a little bit better centered on that blast wall. And uh, it would look kind of cool. I even thought about having a dirt bottom. You know, I, I wasn't sure, um, but we'll just see. So now I have those pieces and I'm going to talk about them a little bit, uh, but I was going to do the top down. And so I'm going to try to get this in a manner in which I can show you this stuff top down because there's a couple of things I thought would be kind of fun to see. Um, let's turn this off. Thank you very much for that, Mark. Um, okay, so we go top down here. So here is, um, you know, the, the hallway that actually leads to the room. So this is our, our blast room uh, or our, our testing room. Um, this is much shorter than this. So what I may be doing is doing like an angle here uh, to, to kind of match that up. I, I, this is going to go everywhere, but you can kind of see the difference there. Uh, here is our fun little um, Livens gun or, or flame projector. Um, it wasn't, I mean, that's the other thing I think that's, that's fun about it. Um, by doing it out of brass, it's a little tougher. It's a little bit easier to work with. It's not quite so delicate as plastic. There's certainly plastic and, and, and a styrene on it, but uh, the brass I think is, is a really uh, a good way to do it. Um, here is the little turntable. I said turnstile when I was first posting about it this week, but it's actually a turntable. I'm going to try to zoom in here because, you know, I did this a few times. This week, I'm trying to take this little tube right here, and I'm trying to glue it down to something flat. And I did that in a couple instances. That's exactly the how I, I tried to start at the base of the Livens uh, flame projector was I started with a tube and I needed basically a flange. And so if you can't find a flange or you don't want to cut one, um, I was able to just find a, uh, a washer 
And by putting the washer down around the tube and then securing it with super glue, it secured it really nice. You know, um, I didn't have to cut into this. I didn't have to do any other shoring or anything like that. Just that flanger out there, uh, you know, gave it the stability to keep it like upright. So it's not going to bend or break off. I mean, it's not there. I can't put any stress on it, but at least I can mount it on there really good. So again, it's just a, a piece of brass tubing. And then I put a washer around it at, and it fit nice and relatively snug. And then uh, with the, the addition of the super glue, that became a perfect mount to keep that on there. So if you're trying to do that same thing, that's one way to do it. Here is um, the underside of the that tracked piece, uh, you know, where we're going to have the little track. And, and here's where I did the, uh, the um, uh, baking soda and CA glue. And I just wanted to show you this because I'm telling you, this stuff is like rock hard. Listen to this. So, I mean, when I'm putting that there, it's not coming off. Typically, if I were joining two pieces, like I was saying before, it'd have like a mechanical thing. And that's what I've done here. So at the end of this tunnel, it looks like they're continuing to build the tunnel. Okay. Uh, and that's the side where they're going to be actually digging on the, on the mine face. So they're digging this as they move forward. So each has to be piece by piece. Well, with these pieces, you've got something to connect to. And then the floorboards can be continued on so uh but that one that was just kind of a thing on my my part um this is actually flexi gauge and and i've glued it so it won't flex but the nice thing about this stuff is is it's flexible so one track is basically uh secured to these little fake uh plastic track or ties and then this one is loose uh i've got more of it here and so the cool thing is <clears throat> is you can just do this right? You don't have to buy corner pieces. Uh, now it's got some spring to it, so you got to secure it very well. But, you know, I could do something like that. Now, that's one of the, the, the issues that I came with on this uh, when I had to do that, that little turntable. What I said to myself as well, do I want to cut that corner that deep? And that was right there, the issue. That was the deciding point of saying, I'm going to do a turntable because it just took up a little bit too much room. I had room. I just didn't think it was how they would do it. Um, I think when they're down in the tunnels, of course, you know, they've got these sections of track and they've got, I mean, are they going to bend a track? It's not easy. Or are they going to keep sections of track that they could bend? No, I, I, I doubt it. Now I said earlier on like my live, not live streams, but my, my shorts, um, I don't have any evidence that they used a turntable. I use something that I know is in the real industry and I just use, well, that would be easier than bending tracks. So that's why I put this in here. It's not that I really understand that this is something that they would use. I don't know, but um, it works. The other thing I think I need to do is, and, and I'm waiting on the trucks, you know, the little wheels that, that go on a little train. Um, I've got some end gauge trucks that I've ordered and when I get those in, then I can build the little cart. And once I've built the little cart, I think this on one side of it, like as the cart's coming in here, it needs a stop, right? So it needs to stop the cart, but I can't build that until I see how big the cart's going to be. Uh, it just needs to be a flatbed because all they're doing, it's not like a, like a train car, you know, that you're filling dirt into. It's not like that. It's a flatbed cart. It's very low. And they're loading sandbags on it from the dirt that they're digging and pulling out of the, uh, of the mining operation that they're doing. So yeah, that's, that's to come uh, once I get those. Um, and then lastly, this is the little short straight tunnel that goes right off of, here's our down shaft. This comes right off the back of the down shaft and goes directly toward no man's land. Um, this is going to be a listening position. And that's one of the things that they had. It was very, um, very necessary because remember we talked about, or I talked about um, underground, you could hear stuff. And there were German soldiers digging as well as 
Anzacs digging toward the Germans. There were Germans digging towards the Anzacs. And so you had to have listening stations. So they had specifically placed listening stations where they would have somebody at the end of a tunnel and just listening. And so that's what this is going to be. So I'm trying to represent kind of like all the little different things that, that basically I saw in movies or I saw in pictures and, and, and reading and stuff like that. Um, okay. I need to come back because I think there's some comments here that are necessary. Uh, Mark Dramus, I got a thumbs up. Perfect. I think that was for your dropped area. I used air dry clay for my clay. What it tended to use bill. Yeah. I like to use air dry clay too, Neil. It totally really liked that stuff a lot better. Um, number one, for me, the reason I got it was the cost. I said, this costs a heck of a lot less than Milliput. Number two, there's there's some really neat properties uh, to the clay. Uh, it has some fiber in it. And in a previous diorama, my Tarawa diorama, I was able to do, um, it's kind of hard to explain, but but basically when you're firing a weapon, right? Like a big, like a big artillery piece, right? There's a big massive concussion that comes out the end of the, the, the barrel. Okay. Well, if that is placed over sandbags, the concussion over time will split those sandbags. Okay. It's just, it's just too much. It breaks the fibers down and it splits the sandbag. I saw this when I was in the military. Well, I did that in one of my dioramas with sandbags with this air dry clay and the cool thing is is when you kind of manipulate it and look at the top of that sandbag and you're pulling it apart it looks fibrous like cloth and then so i, I kind of peel it back it looks like that and so little fibers coming up for the air dry clay the, the kind i use is sculpey and then i sprinkle a little sand in there <clears throat> looks like a blown sandbag and it's awesome so air dry clay for me uh, at least for sandbags for, for good. Um, I have some Milliput and I use Milliput. It's great stuff. It's quite a bit more expensive. Uh, but again, for its application, can't beat it. Okay. Thanks very much, Neil. Uh, I use air dry clay for my clay digging out face. We're going to use bill. Aha. So I asked this question before and, and I made this comment that I wasn't sure how I was going to do that end face where they're digging. And I didn't know that you used air dry, but that's perfect, Neil. That's kind of what I was thinking of doing. Maybe a mix of that and, and the sanded grout, you know, uh, around it for the, like the rope, the stuff that kind of falls. Uh, but that's great. Yeah. That's probably what I'm going to do. And I'd love to love to see more on how you did that. Um, I love your 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 kind of work in progress pictures, Neil. Uh, but I bet me and a lot of other people would like to know how you're doing stuff, just like you're saying here. So that's really cool. Maybe we could have you on the show sometime. You know, I've had special guests on before, and and it's always been fun. So uh, maybe we should talk about it. And you know, I, this is the same thing I did last time. I'm such a jerk. I'm like saying this online in front of everybody that doesn't give you a really good out. So I'm very sorry about that. My apologies. Uh, so, but it would be fun to have you on. Oh, I, you know, I can't, I can't deny that. Uh, ba -ba -da -ba -da. So uh, the clay at the depth would be blue clay. As you come up to the trench, it would be different colors of earth, loam, etc. And under the blue clay, the flint would be chalk. Very cool. And, and that's something that I saw in some of the movies. There were different colors of the soil and, and things that were going that they were going through. And because it was relatively consistent in the area they were digging, one side could tell what the other side was depth wise. So that's pretty neat. I mean, I, you know, I love the thought of, about that happening, you know, during world war one, you're just, obviously you're, you're, you're fighting a war but you're also using everything in your capabilities to figure out what the other guys are doing. And that's just something that is, that is very special to that. Um, it's not good or bad. I'm not, I'm not trying to uh, say good about war, nothing like that, but it is something that forces you to use the very best you got uh, because it is a life and death situation. So uh, I, I think it's amazing what people come up with during wartime. Um, 
And Neil says, great, no problem. Neil, we got to work on that this week. And, and I don't know when we would do it, but I think it'd be great because, I, you know, with you working on your diorama now, it'd be really neat to see uh, some of your processes, just talking about it, just even, you know, looking at some of those pictures and talking about them. It'd be a lot of fun. I think it'd be great. So thank you very much, sir. I really looking forward to that. Um, okay. So that's what I got. Uh, and then tomorrow, um, I'm having the Seattle amps folks come out to the chateau, um, and should be a lot of fun. It's sometimes a chateau. Sometimes it's a ranch. Sometimes it's, um, it's like a state park out here, you know, whatever. Um, but yeah, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm really looking forward to it. Like I said, I don't have people out to the house, the shop. My shop is at my house. Um, my shop is kind of my sanctuary. Um, so it's kind of a big deal for me. I don't know about anybody else, but it's kind of a big deal. So I'm really looking forward to it. And I'm really looking forward to showing people the shop. We're also going to do um, a little class on building a basic diorama base. I imagine some of it will get filmed. And I'd love to share that with you next week or throughout the week when I, I give little updates and stuff like that. But um, yeah, I'm really looking forward to that tomorrow. Well, it looks like Mark has got to get out of here. Thank you very much for coming by, Mark. It was wonderful uh, to see you. And um, I hope to see you at a meeting here soon. Uh, I really appreciate it. Folks, I think we're pretty much done for the day. Um, if you have any questions, please write them in. If you if you miss it and I don't get them and, and it happens after the fact, please do write them in. I do answer them. You know that. Um, and so I really appreciate you coming in. Uh, I'm having a great time with this diorama. I love your suggestions. Please keep that going. Uh, those suggestions really are fun because sometimes stuff comes up that I have no idea. I'd never heard about it, never thought about it. I mean, before the Libbins gun, four or five years ago before I saw that, I had no idea. Um, I think they actually produced it in conjunction with uh, one of the releases of Lord of the Rings because they were, I think that's what, what maybe started them doing it. And I'm such a Lord of the Rings fan that that might have led me to seeing that video so many years ago. So, anywho, thank you so much, everybody. Uh, Mark says got to go. Paul is here. Thanks very much, Paul. I didn't know you were on earlier, but I, I hope you got to see most of it, and I hope it was enjoyable. Uh, I hope it was interesting. I don't always know if it will be, but I really appreciate it if you did like it. Um, great show. Thanks, Bill, and thank you very much, Neil, for coming on. That's really super fun. You know, this is a gentleman that I saw a long time ago, uh, just was so impressed. And now he's on the show and might be on the show. I really, really, uh, think that's fantastic. And, 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 and I know you guys are going to really enjoy what you see too. Uh, Flop Kip, uh, see you again next time. Thanks very much for coming by, sir. I appreciate it very much. And thanks once again, Bill. Have a fun tomorrow. Don't forget the novel. Uh, and cheers from Holland. Thank you very much, Martin. I will look at that. Yeah. I think Birdsong, uh, you know, it sounds, Birdsong sounds like, you know, Japan or something like that. Sorry, I think there was a movie with Birdsong in the title. But I, you know, when you think about it, the mining in World War I, oh my goodness. Gripping, gripping, gripping stuff. So thank you very much. I appreciate that, Martin. And Eric, thanks, Bill. See you tomorrow. Have a great one, everybody. I hope you have a wonderful Friday. I hope you have a wonderful weekend. I hope you get a chance to get at your bench and do a little bit of modeling. Um, and if not, you could watch my videos and, and there you go. It's almost like modeling. Have a great one, everybody. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.